since the dawn of time. The importance of one question has outweighed all others. What's for dinner? From the wind-chilled tundras of the Arctic to the dry dunes of the Sahara, all the way to the deepest rainforests of the Amazon. Our omnivorous nature has allowed humans to survive and thrive. But how did we go from hunting and gathering on the Serengeti to grabbing a snack from the fridge? Perhaps the answer was as elemental as the kiss of fire. Once our ancient ancestors tasted that first cooked meal, there was no going back. Cooking has driven human evolution, invention, and progress. In this series, we'll serve up a story two million years in the making of what was, is, and will be on our plates. Almost nine million years ago, our ape-like ancestors began their descent from trees onto the grasslands of the African savanna. What drove them from branches to bipedalism has puzzled us, their descendants, for millennia. Could the explanation be as simple as an empty stomach? Over millions of years, the climate of Africa shifted. Dense forests gave way to great grassy landscapes, teeming with delicious new species of flora and fauna. Meet Littlefoot. She's a 3.6 million year old Australopithecus. Discovered in the Starkfontein Caves of South Africa, Littlefoot is the most complete skeleton ever found of these ancient human ancestors. Australopithecines were a lot like chimpanzees, and they ate like it too. Littlefoot may do scavenging the grasslands and trees for her meals. On the menu, low-calorie, fibrous fare of seeds, grasses and fruit. Richard Wrangham is a Harvard primatologist. The Australopithecines, these relatives, between maybe seven million years ago and two million years ago, they were at the simplest kind of level, like chimpanzees that stood upright. That is to say, they walked on their hind legs, if you like. They were about the size of chimpanzees. They had big jaws like chimps, big teeth like chimps. I mean, you can imagine somebody like Mick Jagger opening his mouth and screaming out, and that mouth is just a tiny little mouth compared to what a chimpanzee or Australopithecus can do. They need big teeth to mash this uh, low quality, high fiber food. They need a big mouth to put it all into. To get there something like 2,000 calories a day, they have to spend about six hours a day just chewing, literally just moving their, their jaws up and down, processing this uh, bulky, uh, low energy food. So it's a, it's a lot of work. To digest the hard vegetation, Littlefoot had a longer large intestine and colon. Here, her intestinal microbes ferment and break down the food to release a little hard-earned nutrition. But humans today don't have to work so hard. When we compare ourselves with our closest relatives, then what we see is that everything about our digestive system is reduced, it is diminutive. So we have small mouth, we have small teeth, we have small guts. This all reflects the fact that we have a very high quality diet with a lot of nutrients per mouthful. While we might struggle to see the resemblance between Littlefoot and ourselves, 
The next stage of our evolution became distinctly more human. Around two million years ago, that's when you get for the first time the emergence of the full genus Homo, Homo erectus. The bones are a little bit heavier, they've got rather big, broad faces with uh, big brow ridges, uh, so they definitely look kind of primitive compared to us, but nevertheless, they were human. What ignited our bodies to evolve so drastically? We cannot understand humans as evolving into this species that was eating and committed to very highly digestible food without them using fire. Lightning strikes, raging forest fires, volcanic eruptions. These fiery forces of nature must have been terrifying for our ancient ancestors, like Littlefoot. But these dangerous phenomena also yielded great bounty for daring foragers. Scavengers discovered that tough tubers and the flesh of animals tasted far better when they'd been touched by fire. Once you have fire, everything changes. So when did we harness this power? Archaeology and geoarchaeology is important in trying to solve this big mystery, which is how we became human. Dr. Francesco Berna and his colleagues have discovered enlightening evidence of humanity's early relationship with fire in the deep recesses of South Africa's Van der Werk cave. We're showing that this intimate relationship between human and fire is directly documented starting 1.7 million years ago. The peculiarity and the magnificence of this cave is that contains evidence of humans being in there since the origin of humanity. It is an archaeological phenomenon because it has a sequence of human occupation which sees us through our evolution as a species from Homo erectus into modern humans as Homo sapiens. This is a block of intact sediment which we have taken from the context of 1.78 million years old and older in Van der Werk Cave. So over here, we have an intact bone from specimen X, which is discolored. Sometimes discoloration may indicate staining from the sediments which surround the bone. Other times it may indicate burning. The slides of this ancient earth hold remnants of a hugely consequential moment in human history. There's a long particle here. It shows the characteristic of being wood ash. This seemingly simple discovery is anything but. Dr. Berner has found the oldest known evidence of humanity's use of fire. That's extremely exciting. They put human and fire in the same spot early on uh, in human evolution. With the controlled use of fire, we first began to cook our food. This act of transformation had revolutionary effects on our sustenance. So basically, heat jiggles molecules and breaks them apart and then that's nice. When you cook, you're saving yourself a lot of the energy that otherwise the body would be using to digest raw food. So we get a bonus from how much of the food can be digested and we get a bonus from saving ourselves the cost of digesting the food. Thanks to cooking, we had a newfound surplus of energy, which went straight to our heads. We're not using that metabolic energy for our gut. What should we do with it? Hmm, let's make a bigger brain. We have the largest brain in relationship to body weight of any primate. For the average person, about a quarter of all of the food calories you eat go to fueling your brain. 
So this is an organ that is only a 40th of your body weight, but it's occupying a quarter of your food. So it's incredibly hungry and expensive to fuel all the time. Cooking with fire sparked our evolution. And we've had one thing on our minds ever since. Filling our stomachs. Technological breakthroughs like stone tools helped us to kill and prepare our suppers. And we continued to be keen gatherers. The importance of fire to fuel our minds and light our way never waned. Fire was essential to our first hunter-gatherer societies. We lived as hunter-gatherers for millions of years. Today, the lifestyle that made us who we are is practiced in only a few remote corners of the world. In Tanzania, near Olduvai Gorge, the cradle of humankind, lives one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer societies. The Hudson Bay. Tamaduni yetu sisi ni muhimu kwa sababu kwanza ni jamii ambayo tunaishi tofauti kabisa na jamii zingine kwa sababu sisi tunaishi kulingana na mazingira. Their lifestyle and diet gives the world an important insight into our human history. Azabe wanaishi kwa kutegemea maisha ya porini ambao pia tunategemea zaidi ya arzi kama mazingira hakuna pia maisha azabe hakuna It's mid morning in the Hadza Bay camp and it's time for the first meal of the day A group of men and women head out to the nearest baobab tree. These baobabs can be thousands of years old, supplying delicious fruit to generations of Hadzabe. The women break down the fibrous, delicious fruits. The baobab fruit is the staple of the Hadzabe diet packed with vitamins, fat, and fiber. <laughs> the high levels of vitamin C provide an unexpected citrus tang. Conga robi berries are refreshing and slightly sweet, and they happen to pack 20 times the fiber of your average farmed berry. The Hadzabe see food wherever they look in their native land. They eat an amazing variety of almost 600 plant and animal species. With their bountiful diet, they eat around 100 grams of fiber a day, 10 times more than the average American. This nourishment provides the Hadzabe men with the energy they need for hunting. They're hoping to track a few dekdek or kudu. Like the hundreds of generations before him, Nyoha grew up hunting on these Hadzabe ancestral lands. <laughs> It takes years of training and incredible strength to hunt with one of these weapons. The Hadza Bay must observe and study their environment. And hunting teaches a great lesson. Patience. Nyoha finally has something in his sights. A pembe, 
or rock rabbit. The lean meat is cooked over an open fire. In the life of a hunter-gatherer, meat is only a small part of the diet, and only after a successful hunt. Most of their nutrition and calories come from tubers, berries, vegetation, and when it's in season, a Hadzabe favorite, honey. Nyoha is listening intently for the song of the Tiko Rico bird, or the honey guide. The Hadzabe have developed a language with these birds, and the two species enjoy a deep and mutually beneficial relationship. High in these branches, is the world's finest all-natural dessert. <laughs> this sweet snack is one of the most energy-dense foods found in nature full of fat, protein, and sugar. The Hadzabe diet is seasonal and deeply entwined with the environment. The lives of the Hadzabe give us a glimpse into how our ancient ancestors ate. On the other side of the world, the benefit of the hunter-gatherer diet is being investigated. A lot of what we've learned from hunter-gatherer diets is a, a window into how our ancestors ate for most of our evolutionary history. It was a high-fiber diet. They definitely had treats like meat and honey, but those things were rare, and their diet was heavily, heavily based on plants. They eat the things that are seasonally available, that is important to maintain our microbial ecosystem. Doctors Erica and Justin Sonnenberg and their colleagues have been studying the effects of the hunter-gatherer diet on the human microbiome. Our specialty is studying the gut microbiome, this complex community of microbes that lives in our gut. We're interested in how the collection of microbes that inhabit our gut influences everything from our immune status to our metabolism to even our moods and behavior through our central nervous system. Study of the human microbiome is often concerned with the way in which this mini ecosystem can affect human health. One of the questions that our lab is interested in addressing is what is a healthy microbiome? In traditional populations, people that live like our ancestors did hundreds of thousands of years ago, hunting and gathering for food, we see a huge increase in diversity, so many more types of species in their gut than are living in the Western gut. The Hadzabe have among the most diverse human guts on the planet, with almost double the amount of fungi and flora of those living on a Western diet. What we're realizing now is that the, the Western microbiome, microbiome associated with industrialized societies, is probably something that um, deviates wildly from the community that we evolved with, and maybe a community that's actually predisposing us to some of our most common and serious diseases. These are things like heart disease, a lot of autoimmune diseases, things like allergies and asthma, inflammatory bowel diseases, cancers, and most of these are diseases that we just don't see in the Hadza. <laughs> Learning from the Hadza Bay and making the effort to improve our gut health by rewilding our diet may be a key ingredient in fighting some of the industrial world's most deadly chronic diseases. The diversity of the Hadzabe diet comes from their connection to the environment. 
and a way of life that has endured the ages. Seven thousand miles away, the traditional ingredients of another ancient people are being brought to the attention of the modern world. And what chefs are discovering is that these ingredients aren't just healthy, they're delicious. Here in Wollongong, Australia, ancient bush ingredients called bush tucker by the Aboriginal natives are cooked up into mouth-watering New Age dishes. So we do Australian cuisine using local produce, um, but also using inspiration from our local surroundings. We use native ingredients, things like native fruits, there's some native game birds, things like wallaby, kangaroo, herbs and spices, there's some amazing, unique ingredients in Australia at the moment. One of the desserts that's on our menu is the Australian fruit tart. Most of these fruits might seem somewhat difficult to work with, but we've found ways in which we can apply them. Chefs Tom and Simon are trying to create and inspire a truly unique Australian cuisine. You can do whatever you want, which makes it really like really exciting and there's no boundaries. What we're trying to push is the use of these native ingredients, acknowledging the culture, acknowledging the history, and putting it into um, modern dishes. Living for 50,000 years in isolation, the Aborigines of Australia are one of the most resourceful peoples on Earth. The Aboriginal people have been here for thousands and thousands of years. To put that into perspective, when was Jesus born? About 2,000 years ago. How old are those Egyptians? About 5,000. When you're talking 40, 50,000 years or more, yeah, there's been a lot of practice. This is my supermarket out here. And now I've got fish out there, I've got all sorts of seashells, boundless resources out there, let alone up here on the land. And when I bring fellas down here to teach them about it, it's also our university. But European settlers and modern day Australians have rarely looked to the Aborigines for edible inspiration. You can go to any market or, or a food fair anywhere in Australia and you can find every cuisine from every country from around the world. China or Morocco or Italian or, or, or anything. But you won't find a bush tucker, hey. It's slowly evolving. I go around teaching people about my culture through the way of bush foods and trying to introduce them into another way of living and knowledge. The native animals and plant life of Australia evolved in isolation, leading to a diversity of ingredients unique to the rest of the world. Here we have finger lime, which is a native lime, extremely tasty and very, very special. They basically look like little caviar, that lime tasting and they, you pop them and they have you know, little bursts of acidity. The one thing about native ingredients is we need to have the understanding that it's a reflection of Australia and a reflection of our environment and our weather especially. And so you know, talk about Australia, it's so hot, it's so dry. If you've ever grown strawberries, you know strawberries need a lot of water to be sweet. And so our native fruits are all sour, bitter, green, because we don't have the water that it requires to be sweet fruit. If you think about emu, wallaby, kangaroo, all really lean because they don't have the ample amount of food to have those fat reserves. Uh, so we've got some braised wallaby tail. It's very much like oxtail wallaby tail. Uh, it's quite fatty, gelatinous meat. It takes quite a lot of cooking, but really delicious once you do. 
There's definitely trial and error, and I think as chefs you can take an ingredient, you can taste it, you can work out flavours it's going to work with. Also from people we've done work with, Fred from Fred's Bush Tucker, a little bit of cooking with him. He sort of taught us some very traditional ways. We've taken that into the kitchen and, and sort of replicated that. So I have a barramundi, dry it for about three days. This dish is based on a quite traditional way of cooking barramundi. It's normally take a whole barramundi, wrap it in paper bark, soaked in water, layer it with lemon myrtle leaves. The smoke will come up through the lemon myrtle, flavouring the fish. I mean, you can smell it now. It fills the room. So this is the little salad that goes with the barramundi. In a coastal city, we just have access to amazing beaches and there's so much edible plants and foods there. If you stop and look, you can find some pretty tasty stuff. Restaurants like Caveau are finding inspiration in underutilized natural food diversity to bring old flavors to modern diners. We want to see these ingredients just treated as normal ingredients. I think that's the future, just getting them into home kitchens, demystifying what they are and how they react. And it's starting to get there. The importance of this food revival goes beyond mere tastes and flavors. Look, a lot of our elders are dying these days. If we don't do something about our Aboriginal culture now, through food, through tourism, through art, we're going to lose it. The Aboriginal people are just going to lose their knowledge. And you've got to share your knowledge to keep it, really. So that's part of my role, uh, I feel, to try and impart some of the knowledge that I have to, to the younger generation and the, and the general public. I want more fellas out there doing what those fellas are doing and showing off our proud culture. All the ingredients are here in our backyard. The diversity inherent in reintroducing these foods to our diets is in sharp contrast to how most of us eat today, to our own detriment. If we are to improve our health in the future, we must take some lessons from the past. No matter who you are or what you eat, cooking deserves its place as one of the great revolutionary innovations of history. I believe that humans became human when an ape learned to cook. So truly, it is impossible to imagine humans as a species without fire. Fire is what made us. Fire is the creator of the human species. We are the creatures of the flame. The campfires of our ancestors have become the restaurants and kitchens of today. Cooking has moved on from food touched by fire to culinary works of art. We fry, roast, boil, and bake. Cooking changed our bodies, our brain, and ignited a cognitive revolution in human beings. This would lead to an equally consequential period in human history, the agricultural revolution. This epic event turned our hunter-gatherer lifestyle on its head and introduced a plethora of new plant and animal species to our diets. And it all led to one of the greatest inventions in culinary history, the taco.